was a year that uh, Spielberg and Coppola were directing two of my scripts that nobody wanted to do. Been turned down by every studio five times. Um, what do you mean a grown up Peter Pan? A grown up Peter Pan, they can't fly, you know. And Dracula's been done. Um, and it really all is about finding your voice. And I was blessed to have um, those two um, mentors and teachers um, teach me a lot. And we're all basically the same age, so you know, it was it was more like battling brothers than uh, than teacher and mentor. My point is is that Sundance g g gives confidence and gives support uh, and gives your voice the kind of encouragement that it needs. Um, if you don't get in, uh, my daughter has had three scripts turned down here, two films turned down here, but she just directed her first feature with Lily Ray. Her first produced uh, film came out of the blacklist called The Keeping Room with Sam Worthington, um, Haley, Haley Seinfeld, and um, uh, Britt Marling. Download it, look at it. Um, but it, an idea of Sundance has now expanded. Uh, organizations like the ISI, uh, Craig, and uh, Molly and uh, Felicity and, and uh, Max, I mean, ScreenCraft, there's so many of these organizations that are doing uh, solo aerobics for writers. And I jumped at the chance to come back to Sundance uh, to speak. Um, but what I want to talk about today is not the craft of screenwriting. Uh, you'll get my postcard about that. So. Uh, what I want to talk about today is something that I realized in this last two years that I am not just a screenwriter. I'm a fucking job creator. I'm a job creator. Every one of you that's a writer is a job creator. And we're all running for president. <laughs> Watch out, Donald. Here we come. And I didn't know that at first, but my, my great mentor, Frank Pearson, who knows who Frank Pearson is? Who, who can say one of his lines that he wrote? Say the line. <laughs> the other one is Attica. Actually, Pacino ad lib that, but that's okay. Frank took credit for it. <laughs> what we have here is a failure to communicate. That's Frank Pearson. He was my first advisor here at Sundance when I came in as one of that very rarefied air breathing group. Uh, and he took me under his arm immediately because I was not I was not doing well with my career with Mr. Spielberg and Mr. Coppola directing my movies. I still felt very outside, very disenfranchised, very disconnected. I know you're going, what? You know. Frank took me to the home mall bar and got me good and drunk on single malt. And he said, kid, let me tell you something. When you feel like you're down in the dumps and you're going to jump off the cliff and nobody gives a shit about what you write, and everybody hates your stories, your characters suck, you can't get a career, your agent won't return your phone call, you know, your wife said get a real job. He said, just remember this. No director, no actor, no cinematographer, no sound man, no editor, no costume designer, no set designer, no set dresser, no craft services person, no truck driver, uh, no publicity person, uh, no, no uh, post-production sound people. Nobody has a job until you type the end. Nobody has a job until you type the end. And I said, oh, gee, thanks, Frank. He's just making me feel good, you know. Just tell yourself that, you know, and you'll wake up the next morning and go, but I don't have a job. <laughs> that stayed with me all these years. It got me through some dark times, but I'm not sure I believed him. I'm not sure I really believed Frank. And then, Hook and Dracula happened, and I began to look back on them. That was what was so hard for me right now, seeing Robin and Bob hostage. You missed Bob's opening line. Good morning, Neverland! Good morning, Sundance. And watching Robin and Bob um, in these amazing performances, Hook is 25 years old. We're celebrating in Austin next weekend with Rufio. Dante's coming down. He's 40. Uh, Jimmy Matteo's coming down. My son Jake is coming down. And we're having a 25th celebration screening with Alamo Draft House of Hook. That film came from my six-year-old son. He is now my 35-year-old writing partner. He was a job creator at age six with one line. What if Peter Pan grew up? So at age 11, 
He was able to walk onto the set, see the pirate ship being built, see the pirate town being built. Hundreds and hundreds of jobs created for over a year. My son created those jobs. Of course, I had to steal it and, and you know, rip it off and <laughs> write the screenplay. My son was a job creator. I didn't understand that. For two years, Hook and Dracula, back to back, occupied the whole Sony lot. Employed over a thousand people, you know, um, uh, uh, from everything from pirates to Indians to, to vampires to sexy women who, you know, were, were sucking your throat and stuff, you know. DP, sound people, amazing. I didn't understand this. My cart, my little golf cart, said Hook and Dracula on it. Pretty heady stuff for me. One day there was an accident between two carts. The Hook cart hit the Dracula cart. <laughs> it's a really funny photo. Huh? So for a screenwriter, I didn't appreciate the fact that I had typed the end on these two screenplays that nobody wanted to do. Turned down all over town. And then Spielberg and Francis Coppola, thanks to Winona Ryder, uh, said, can, can I, we'd like to direct. You know, I didn't realize this until two years ago. And I listened to politicians talk about, hey, we're going to create, create jobs, we're going to create jobs, we're going to create jobs, we're going to create jobs. And they're filling you full of campaign promises and they don't really deliver shit. Screenwriters and television writers create thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs every single year. Jen knows this. I mean, the television has to hire writers. They require it. Nobody's writing that shit. But, I mean, they're not, the executives aren't doing it. You know, we haven't created AI yet, thank God, that can try to do it. We can always unplug it. Thousands of jobs. You saw it when we had a strike, and I hope we never have another strike. We shut down catering services. We shut down printing businesses. We shut down car rental businesses. We, we killed hotel rooms. We, I mean, it was horrible when you realize what that strike did to the industry of how widespread writing impacts our business. And I mean the independent world, too. In the independent world, you need producers and financiers. They're the lifeblood of indie film. 25 executive producers on a film that each gave $1,000 or $10,000 or whatever it was. God bless them. But they needed your script before they could go do that. So I think that what dawned on me in 2014, and the last feature I had out was a big animated film that Bill Joyce and I had worked on for 15 years. Uh, epic. It was called Epic. Epic what? It was an epic. It was based on Legend of the Leaf Men. And this is to Fox's credit, because they do this on every single film. I was hosting a screening in, Sing in uh, Singapore or Taiwan or something. Um, the film did very well outside of our country. Uh, it didn't do well here because it wasn't talking to animals trying to get from the toilet to the shopping mall. You know, it, was, it was a real story there, real characters. And as I'm watching the film, the last credit that comes up on the screen, it says over 12,000 jobs were created in the making of and and authorized distribution of this motion picture. Over one million work hours were expended in the making of this motion picture. And then it had the names of all the babies that were born during the making of this motion picture. The film took eight years to, to, to we stopped and started so many times, it took eight years of actual production to, to realize it. And I saw that credit and I went, wow. Bill Joyce and I sat out in his backyard chasing fireflies. If you don't know who Bill Joyce is, this is, um, this is uh, um, uh, Robots and uh, uh, Rise of the Guardians and uh, Santa Calls and, and uh, George Shrinks and he's an amazing uh, children's book author and, and dear close friend. We set out, you know, getting stoned and drinking red wine and chasing fireflies, trying to figure out a way to do a fairy story. And we did it. And it in 1999, we started writing it. That's a long time, but the jobs we created and, and spawned uh, were enormous. And I realized that was when it hit me that Frank Pearson was right. He wasn't bullshitting me. We're job creators. That doesn't mean that every time you type the end, something's going to happen, but when you type the end, it's the beginning. What's the first thing that happens when you, when you type the end? You want, to shoot, you want to blow your brains out? You, you, you want to go get drunk? You want to go, oh, it's all shit or shite all over the gaff? It's a beginning. It's the beginning of a trail 
that exponentially grows the farther you get down that line. When you're, when you're trying to get the financing together, you may have an agent, you may have a manager, you may have a, an angel, you may have a friend. You're not really creating a job yet. But once you go into pre-production, I mean, if you're in the studio system, you've got uh, assistants and uh, executives and uh, creative executives um, who all have jobs waiting for that next screenplay to cross their desk that they're going to be able to go, this is the next Star Wars, you know, or this is the next Little Miss Sunshine, you know. Everybody's looking for that script. You have opportunities now that we didn't have. Those doors were closed to us. Doors are wide open for you guys. In television, in indie film, you can now make it on your iPhone. Did anybody see Tangerine? Hello? <laughs> iPhones. So we didn't have those opportunities. The walls have come down. There's no more rules. You know, Netflix has changed that. Amazon's trying to. Um, there's 66 buyers now where there used to be eight. Is that, is that about right? Um, so once that process begins, you have an exponential effect on the lives of hundreds of people. Jake, at age 11, would sit on the set every day of Hook, and Spielberg let him come to dailies, you know, let him hang out on the set all day, and he would watch. And Robin Williams would come up to Jake every day in his Peter Pan outfit and bow to Jake and say, thank you for my job, Jake said. Thank you for my job. I should have known then. I should have figured it out, and I didn't. Thank you for my job, Jake. We lost him way too quick. Uh, he was a, a dear friend. Um, but my point is, is we were sitting around the set one day, and Jake's in there, he's hanging out with the Teamsters and the and the, the camera loaders, and, the, he was, and he was a lost boy in the, in, in the fight scene. So he was having all the fight coordination. He was in a lot of the shots. And he heard everybody talk. You know, one guy said, yeah, I gave my, my daughter $30,000 for her wedding, you know. And, ah, I bought my kids a new car. And, yeah, I got my grandson's tuition socked away now. It was all because of Hook. Jake came to me one day, and we were driving home from the set or something, and he said, this is lost boy. He said, Dad, a lot of people are getting stuff out of this, you know. What are we getting? What do you get? You know, I said, you don't have to worry, Jake. Your college education is paid for. But he understood, he began to understand Stan right then that his, they gave him a shirt that said creator on it. He had something to do with the outcome of those people's lives. David Crosby, uh, who's in Hook as well, he's the pirate who gets kicked in the groin. Plays the accordion. Crosby gave me another um, way of looking at this. He said, when you write a song, you think of it as a paper airplane. And you throw the paper airplane off the top of the Empire State Building. And you don't know who's going to land, who's going to open it up and read it and have their lives changed. Several of you today have just mentioned to me where we met, something you remember, an incident that we were both present at. We don't know how we're going to affect people when we type the end and put it out there to the world. We just don't. My friend Michael Caine is here. Michael Caine gave me my, one of my first opportunities to do the Dracula heart chart at the Dallas International Film Festival. He started the Deep Bellum Film Festival. He gave me my first award. He encouraged me. You know, uh, Shelley Hamill, uh, who was the Bermuda International Film Festival, was here today. You know, we did a heart chart with Craig Borton in attendance. Um, uh, and I've gotten lots of emails and, and requests since then because you don't know how your writing is going to impact that unseen audience that's out there waiting to read you. That's why I mentioned the blacklist. And there's other, there are other older, even older and, 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 and more well-heeled uh, script services that provide uh, that kind of access. So I guess at my, at my ripe old age, um, I'm now working, I'm now busy at River Bend for a third of the money, so I'm going to be independent again here pretty soon. Uh, the last one I wanted to talk to you about was finding your voice, which is what thematically this was supposed to be about. I hope that I've kind of hit on that. My daughter came to me. My daughter, Julia, they're both in the business. I don't know what happened. They're both in L.A. They've got managers, agents, pension, health, and health care, and I'm happy. My daughter came to me, having just graduated from Columbia. She wanted to go to L.A. My son and daughter were steeped as playwrights. They directed a lot of theater at Columbia. They, did, they wrote a lot of plays. Uh, they had a great voice as playwrights. And my daughter started trying to write screenplays, and they sucked. 
they were just god awful. And she would say, Dan, you don't like my, I said, no, I don't like your screenplays. Your voice is not there. You're trying to make it fit into a different format, a different thing that you don't understand yet. Your playwright voice is magnificent. Keep that voice. She said, well, can you get me a job with one of your producer friends or the apes or something? And I said, no, I would never do that to you. One, you're smarter than they are. Uh, you, you'll get you'll 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 call them some kind of name about the second week into the job when they ask you to go flush the toilet for them, you know. Uh, and uh, they don't they're not going to want to know, you know. This was those days. I said, go out if you want to go to L.A., go out there with a job, go out there with a project. Don't go out there looking for a job. Go out there with something, a body of work. Go out there with some kind of job that's going to finance your Jones until you find your voice. So she went and taught school. She taught at, uh, at uh, uh, Oak, uh, Wildwood uh, and at Buckley. She brought literature to these. Um, she's an Eastern girl that was raised in the East and schooled in the East. She brought literature. She brought creative writing. She ran all the musicals, all the school plays. She did, you know. She stayed in touch with her voice. Two years ago, she showed me two screenplays. One was called The Keeping Room, which came to her in a trip to Georgia when she visited a friend's plantation, old plantation farm there. And it just came to her in an instant. She was open to the idea of what is a keeping room. And I would urge you all to see the film as an exercise of what you can do for, for you know, under $5 million uh, with big stars that are beyond, that, 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 that don't normally do indie films. Well, Rick Morley does. And she showed me another script called Miss Stevens based on her teaching experiences. She quit her job, her husband's a producer, got, got keeping room financed, and then they raised $600,000 to make Miss Stevens with Lily Red. And she just shot a locked picture last week. Five years, but now she's one of the most um, in-demand young female writers in, in uh, our business. She's writing for HBO. There's three female actors that have come, come to her to write scripts. So the waiting time is not wasted time create a body of work. If somebody asks you what's next, we like this script, but we're not gonna do this, what's next? Have 10 things that are what's next. Always have an answer to what's next. Um, and there are other ways you can create those jobs. You don't just need a studio system or, or a television system. You can create those jobs. By the way that many of the independent films uh, are getting made or being made here. How many members of the Writers Guild do we have? Okay. I would also urge you to look at the Writers Guild. Um, some of you may be uh, non-union, anti-union, anti-guild, but look at the Writers Guild. There are memberships that we made available for people uh, who are who have not made films yet or have films under a million dollars. I would urge you to, to investigate the Writers Guild when you can, because my pension now pays for my overhead. My health care is better than than most. It's all guaranteed, uh, and they defend your rights. The last thing I wanted to say, there's a, every one of you, you may have met them today or some, every one of you have people that you will meet in your life that will have an impact on you that you don't want to forget and you don't, and you want to stay in touch with. Jen gave you, gave some very wise advice today about staying in touch with those people that you meet appropriately, you know. No, no selfies of inappropriate things. You know. <laughs> Hi, you want to talk story? Yeah. I get those on Skype all the time. So, what did I do? <laughs> Hi, I'm Denise. Uh, I'm Brandy. What does he have? But, but when you meet these people, like Frank Pearson for me, changed my life. He, he gave me... Uh, we became very close friends for the rest of his life. Uh, I used to introduce myself as his older brother because we had the same shit going on. Those people that impact you, that touch you, that you have a chance to have a connection with, don't forget them. You know, don't say, I've got 20 screenplays I'd like for you to read tomorrow. But stay in touch with those people. Festivals are a great way to meet people. I urge you to try the Austin Film Festival. Celebrate writing. It's still, for me, the, the, my favorite festival in terms of being a writer. I urge you to enter the contest. I urge you to do the blacklist. Join a writing group. Start a writing group. Um, find a way to stay in touch with those people that have touched you and their connections to. I didn't do that. 
you know, it took me a long time. I was 44 years old when we made Hook. You know, I mean, it took a while. So, well, I'll tell you the story of one of those guys that tests me. I, at the end of uh, the 90s, I was pretty much in the dumps. I hadn't had anything produced. I had a deal at Fox that rendered a bunch of good screenplays, but no movies. Uh, it was sunsetting. Uh, my agency um, was now dumping me for the second time. They dumped me when I was writing Hook and Dracula because nobody would ever make Hook and Dracula. They said, hey, go away. Uh, and there was a Jesuit, former Jesuit priest who had, his name is Mark Gavigan. He is a brilliant script consultant. He's just consulted for several companies uh, in this last two months. We had done workshops together, very soft-spoken. Former Jesuit, left the order, stayed uh, with uh, a spiritual calling to the media traveled all over the world shooting these amazing documentaries uh, about faith. Uh, he would always call me at interesting times during my life, you know, and he got me at midnight one night in my barn and I was had mint. Some of that single malt that Frank taught me how to drink. And it was Bart, Jim, that really soft Irish lilt, you know, just. And he was calling me at midnight, he was in, um, so where are you? He said, I'm in Switzerland, I'm in St. Moritz, I'm at the top of El Capitan. So what the hell are you doing there? He said, well, I'm going to tell you. Part of his faith thing was to find people that do things that require faith. And he had been filming his great tall German female camera woman who was fearless in those days, would do anything under the camera that even men wouldn't do. And um, they were following the guys that would jump off El Capitan and uh, open the parachutes. So they would fall, free fall for 1,500 feet open the parachutes. And these are all fit young men, you know, stalwart 20s, perfect physically fit. And he said, I got to the end of the interviews, and then the fifth guy was clearly in good shape, but he was in his 50s. Bart said, what are you doing here? And the gentleman said, well, I'll tell you. My father was a guide up El Capitan. My grandfather was a guide up El Capitan. I'm a guide up El Capitan. And he said, yeah, but you're jumping off the cliff and taking all these incredible risks. He said, something happened to me on my 50th birthday. So I had 10 people in my group. We were on the face of El Capitan. We had 1,500 feet left to climb. It was cold. It was windy. It was my birthday. Every body, bone in my body ached. I was miserable, and I still had 1,500 feet to climb. So I woke everybody up in their slings. We started lining up, you know, to pull. And then you, you rope yourself up and pull. He said, all of a sudden, I could feel it. The body fell by me. I could feel the air just break behind me. I went, oh my God, I've lost one. I've never lost one. And he started yelling, don't look down, don't look back, don't look. Just keep facing the wall. And of course, he leaned out and looked. And he saw this body plummeting. Couldn't figure out which one of his people it was. And all of a sudden, this red plume opened up on the back of that body. And that body started raising up, you know, on the, on the thermals. And he watched this paraglider, this hang glider, this parachutist glide all the way down the same valley for the next 30 minutes, getting the spectacular view. And he was still had 1,500 feet to climb. This guy, the, this parachutist had used gravity to take him somewhere new and exciting. And all he's doing is trying to fight gravity and defeat gravity and challenge gravity and, and try to beat up gravity and, and you know win over gravity. And he said, that right there is when I decided that I was going to go with gravity and stop fighting it. And I said, Bart, thank you. You just saved my career. And that became my new mantra, go with gravity. And within three years, I had produced and written four more films, my first TV series, because I was going to be the person who solved the problems, not created them. Wherever gravity took me, I was going to take it positive. If I was getting resistance, like that same note, that note that you're talking about, that consistent note you keep getting, that's telling you something. You know? I'm not saying don't fight for what you believe in, but gravity will take you places that are very positive. In the 60s, we said, go with the flow. Be part of the solution, not the problem. In that stage of my career, I had been the problem. I was, I was defensive. I was known as an executive hater, you know, very opinionated. Um, I still... Now you have that reputation. But I smile a lot more now. That's a good idea. It sucks. It's a good idea. Um, but to let gravity take you in your work. You know? Listen. Somebody's going to say something. You go, oh, I'm going to write that down. 
It may take you somewhere. You never know where your next idea is going to come. So find your voice. Go with gravity. Be a job creator. Go type the end. And I'm going to shut up. Let's ask some questions, though. Anybody have yeah, a question? Got, I, I, go ahead. Now, let me start with one. No. I'm just curious, Jim, how your, you feel your voice has changed since the early 90s to now. And have you seen evolutions of how that voice has changed? Uh, how has my voice changed? I had to reinvent myself every 10 years. Um, I am in my 70th year, and I still have a career. And one of the things that just happened, I was just speaking to her. What, what, what is your name? I'm sorry. You're, you're going to be at the, at the reading. It's your script today. Oh, Lisa. Yeah, she's, she, her script reading is today. We were just talking about this. Um, I went from a, a kind of a big plot-driven writer to a character-driven writer. And Coppola is the one who put me on that path. Uh, and, and if you see the explosion in television, it's all about character. And in film, it's all about plot, explosion, you know, whatever the, whatever um, sequel you are or whatever IP you represent. But in television, it's about character. And I still feel like the best writing is in the indie films, because indie films are character driven, and in television, they're character driven. So I had a big, big, I had a big lesson to learn. I had to find a way to explore character. Strangely, you should mention that. Who's got a postcard or the heart chart? Hold, hold it up. Here goes. Uh, this started at Sundance and at Dallas and at the Austin Film Festival. I developed my own system of following the character's emotional journey through a narrative structure as opposed to plot driven. Instead of the external plot telling your characters what to do when you want them to do it, the character driven uh, scenario and narrative follows their heart, their fears, their desires, their wounds, their wants, their needs. That's what drives the story. Not me, the external God, going, do this now die there. You know. <laughs> Resurrect. <laughs> it's a good feeling to have that kind of power. But let your, so my biggest transition was learning to let the characters tell the story and finding a way to capture the lightning in a bottle for me. This works for me. That didn't work for you. But last year, uh, gentlemen I was speaking to, you were at the Dallas Buyers Club, chart in Austin, right? There you are. Um, and that was the one that really kicked over into doing an app. They've been begging me to do an app for years, so you have on your laptop that follows the emotional journey of your characters. Um, and Shelley, then we took Craig Borton to, um, to Bermuda, and he saw the chart. The writer saw the chart. But oh my God, you know more about the script than I do. Character. That was my biggest change. And I think television in the last 10 years has altered everything that is being done from now until I'm not around anymore. You'll still be here. But Television and the way we deliver content um, is a huge opportunity for writers. Gigantic. Yes, ma'am. What um, made you keep going on What makes me what keeps me going? Uh, have children and mortgage debt. <laughs> uh, Frank Pearson said to me, the three things you need to, to do to be a screenwriter. Um, you have to be married at least once, <laughs> survive a divorce, uh, develop a taste for single malt, and spend a little time in jail. <laughs> uh, I don't know. My family inspired me. Uh, you, I've told you stories about my, my son and my daughter. My wife has been incredibly supportive over the years. I've had the good fortune of, of meeting people along my way that have, that have said, hey, come join this. But also, I write to shut the voices off in my head, you know? Okay, 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 I hear you, I'll do it. Okay, so let me rest for a minute. So it's a curse, it's a curse and a gift. I'm driven by the stories I still feel like I need to tell. And my list of stories I want to tell is getting shorter. I'm mean, getting longer and my timeline is getting shorter. So there's much more of an urgency for me to get this shit done. Yeah. But if you linger and you dilly-dally and you postpone and you put off, if it's hard to get you, there's 15,000 writers behind you that will take your place. Uh, that's the other thing too is you're, you're, the idea you have is not precious if you've got an idea I'm, someday I'm going to do you know, do it, write it down don't talk about it, write it down you know. yes ma'am what would you say was the trigger in you that made you know 
Uh, this will be a tough one for me to tell, but it's the truth. And she's asking, what, you know, where did you suddenly realize your voice, you know, that you had to follow this voice? Uh, my brother died of AIDS in 1988. The Dallas Pirates Club kept him alive for four extra years, so I had an, an unusual connection to that, to that piece and to Craig's work. Um, and David was a world-class flautist. He played all over the world. He was the one with the real talent in the family. Uh, and he died with dignity in the, in the bed he grew up in, in the home he grew up in, where we were all together. So it was a different, it was a different journey for him. And the last time I saw him, I knew we, we knew it was the end. I mean, there was just nothing left. And this was before uh, all the immune cocktails had kicked in. Uh, and he had read all my stuff. Um, and he, we sat there, we were holding hands, and he, he had tried to go find this healing spring in Caddo Lake in Louisiana and Texas, corner, because he read about this healing spring where you go heal yourself. And he told me the whole story about the journey of my dad and everything. You know. And he said to me at the end, he waited too late to go find his healing spring. And he said, don't wait too long because you don't have as much time as you think. Hook and Dracula came out of that. Nobody wanted to do Hook. I made people crazy. I, I pissed them off. I got fired. But Hook and Dracula got made. Because he knew those were the two things that were burning in me. And it's a mantra I say to myself over and over again. You don't have as much time as you think. And I see Robin. I see Bob. And they're gone. And Kit Carson, who was a great mentor great Sundance, friend of Sundance, was Michael. Michael had to go to a plane, was, was, was my mentor. He's the first guy that took me out of class my freshman year at SMU, from film theory class, when Kit brought David Holzman's diary to show it. If you don't know who Kit Carson is, go LM Kit Carson, go, and go, go Google David Holzman's diary. It was the beginning of the independent film. The Genesis, outside of the Maisel's Brothers and the, the documentarians. And Kit, I asked him a question in class. You said, ask questions. I asked him a question in class. After class, he said, you, come with me. We're going to have coffee. And he sat me down and said, you're going to do this. You're a writer. Yeah, so you get those kind of bliss hits from the gods. You pay attention to them. Yeah, you do. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Um, one of our projects is a comedy. And I once heard Eric Idle say that if you were laughing while you're writing it, it's probably not funny. Um, and I wondered if you agree with that. And if you have a specific process that you use during comedic moments in your script, like do you have a, instead of doing a joke for joke's sake? What, a yeah, uh, this is a good one. I wish my son was here to answer this. We have this debate with executives all the time. Um, Jake and I, my son Jake is also my other writing partner. And uh, we went to see Butch and Sundance uh, last week in LA at the at the Chinese part of the Turner Classics thing. See it on the big screen. And that was a seminal movie for me because George Roy Hill brought a wet gate answer print. Anybody know what an answer print is? <laughs> it's on film. Brought, a, brought an answer print to SMU to show to our little class of 30. We were a nothing film school and George Roy Hill showed up. And he showed us, we were the first audience outside of the, the business community of Hollywood to see Butch and Sundance. George Roy Hill directed it. Uh, and uh, a great script, script by Goldman, a brilliant script by Goldman. And Jake and I were sitting in, in the Chinese marveling at the level of humor in the face of abject danger and death. I mean, they're dying on the floor, shot to pieces. You call that cover? You call that running? You know? Oh my God! Is I saw a straw hat. Is is Lafour's out there? Nah, you were seeing things. Oh, good. For a moment, I thought we were in trouble, and they ran out the door and get the shit shot out of them. I don't think William Goldman was laughing when he wrote that. I think he was writing: these two men are about to die. What would they? What would those characters do in that moment? Would they say? You know, I've always loved you, and you were a great friend to me, and I think we're going to die, and you know, it's my fault I fucked up. And do you think that's what they're going to say? No. The characters that William Goldman created stayed true to who they were right up to the moment of death. 
Jake and I are doing a lot of uh, Kirk Vonnegut's. We've spent time with Kirk before he died, and uh, we have some, some of the projects we've, we've tried for years to set up as features. We're now doing them as television. And the biggest criticism we always get from people who say they know Vonnegut is, well, this is not funny. It doesn't read funny. Kirk gave us three rules. Because all of the adaptations of him have been shit except for Slaughterhouse, George Romero. He said, first thing is, is don't try to make me funny. Don't punch me up. He said, if you really know my characters and look at the situation, that's what's funny. Two, the, big, the next thing that's missing in all of my adaptations is me. Meaning the voice of Kurt. If you read Kurt Vonnegut, you know what that uh, wonderful, uh, sardonic narrative voice he says. You know? um, so we always try to find a character to, to, to make this Kurt. Um, I can't remember what the third one was. But anyway, I'm not a comedy writer. I write very funny things that happen to me. I write very things that, that don't make me laugh, but we know are funny when the actors do them. We always say, this is the actor. Go have a reading. You'll see how funny it is. So if you're writing comedy, that's not my genre, but there is a very specific thing you have to do. I don't know if, I don't think, well, Mel Brooks would laugh. He would laugh. I, I don't think William Goldman laughed when he wrote that last scene, and, and that's the best answer I can give you. Characters have to be honest and true in who they are in the, whatever moment it is. And a lot of people, listen, Indiana Jones, uh, the, the, first, uh, the first script, the very first one, was brilliant because it took all that Errol Flynn and all that, that jovial, jocular stuff in the face of death, which has now permeated our culture. You can't go to one of these films without 87 w witty, quippy lines. Bruce Willis did it in Die Hard. But he did it because that was his character. So I guess that's the best answer I can give. So please take your postcard and take the little heart chart thing and put it on your computer and go check it out. It is a genuine story mapping tool that follows the character's journey, not the plot. And I really want to thank ISA for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Come back to the table reading. It's going to be funny.